Yeah, so I, I don't like the word arthrofibrosis because I think it's far too frequently used and it's often a damn good excuse for a surgeon who's got a bad result. The truth is that when people genuinely have arthrofibrosis, and they do, it does occur. But it's a global scarring of the whole joint. So all the it is it's pretty uncommon. I think there are some patients who I probably have one of these every two years or so. And it tends to follow surgery that... of range of movements are due to mechanical pad scarring as we'll talk later on and actually it's the fault of the surgeon they shouldn't be operated when the knee would need to get the knee right or the surgery was bad so i don't like that term after fibrosis because it's really really rare and most causes of loss of movement are other things it's an opportunity really before we get into the subject to understand some really key the so-called anterior interval is that space between the patella tendon and the anterior uh, tibia and with the knee extended it's full of fat pad as you can see on the picture on the left from a study we didn't publish 10 years ago but with knee flexion you can see how the fat pad is moved up from that position into the knee joint so this anterior interval is full of fat pattern extension, empty inflection, whole area is incredibly dynamic. And that movement, allowing natural movement into extension, the largest soft tissue structure in the knee. Um, it's spared in starvation. Patients who die of starvation will still have uh, a healthy fat pad. So there's something unusual about the type of fat it's also full of stem cells, so it tends to cause scar tissue. And it's also very sensitive. It's got highly innervated and it's a good source of pain. So the patient refuses to move the knee that hurts. Then the stem cells cause a scarring and you get a contracture. And so uh, we've recently done an anatomic study and biomechanical study on this, which we published in the European Journal. So if you've got a patient who's got a stiff knee, first thing you've got to do is exclude infection. We've talked about that already, but a knee that loses range of motion is infected until you prove otherwise. Once you've excluded infection, then you differentiate intra and extra articular causes for stiffness. On the right, you can see two pictures, a very rare case. Somebody was pushed into a plaster of Paris cast to try and get the knee straight. The artery to the medial gastrocnemus was kinked and they got ischemic necrosis of medial gastroc. And in fact, their fixed flexion deformity got worse until I released it, as you can see. But the majority of cases are gonna be intra-articular. And they're usually due to capsular contraction cases. Ligament contracture, medial I can understand, don't understand the concept of ACL contracture. I think if ACL graft is in the correct, to natural ACL, that would stop movement. If you have fractures that are malunited, the obviously the incongruous movement. But for sports surgery like ACLs, it's usually problems of cyclops, lesions, meniscus tears, or a badly placed tibial tunnel. But despite those mechanical causes, most common cause, loss of extension in particular, but also tightness and flexion is fat pad contracture. These x-rays are from a patient from 15 years ago. Perhaps the physiotherapy wasn't so good then. And you can see how the patella is pulled down post-operatively. And this was an old-fashioned operation followed by old-fashioned physiotherapy. And people used to talk about a patella tendon contracture. It's not the patella tendon, it's the fat pad that scars up and draws everything down. Here's an example of a cyclops lesion. You can see a big lump of tissue on the MRI scan here. And then you pop a scope in the joint, there's a big lump blocking the knee in extension. And that's a real win because if you, if you resect it, the knee comes straight. This is another example. And here's the cyclops. And you've got to resect back. And often when you're doing that, I used to get very scared, was I removing the graft? But when you encounter the graft, it really is very obvious. You'll see longitudinal linear fibers and you know it's time to stop. Often in these cases, you'll need to do a, a notch plasty and look for debris from surgery, such as it's a bone that needs to be removed as well. So if there's genuinely a mechanical problem like a cyclops, then that's a really easy scenario to sort out. 
But with the Cyclops, often you get a fat pad contracture because the two go together. And when you have a loss of range of movement, it's important to note that fixed flexion is far bigger a problem than poor flexion. And when a knee won't come straight, the problem is just about always at the front of the joint. It's only very late that you get a posterior capsular contracture. So the most important thing, of course, is to prevent it. And the si single commonest problem is the patient who has a fixed flexion deformity after an ACL never had a straight knee prior to surgery. And the surgeon has got to wait until that knee is quiet, which means full act, not just passive, but active extension, little swelling and flexion of at least 100 degrees. You've got to do good surgery. You've got to put the graft in the right place. You've got to be rather atraumatic with your skills and you try not to touch the fat pad. Now, sometimes you have to, if it's in the way to see, but if you place portals high anterolaterally, then you tend to avoid it and you can do the whole surgery without touching the fat pad. The rehabilitation has got to be done right. I hate the phrase aggressive rehab. If people beat the knee up, it gets more angry and gets stiffer. It needs to be intensive, not aggressive. Often the people with stiffer knee, knees need time for prehab before the operation. And the sort of thing you'll do pre and post op are patella glides, passively get the knee straight with prone hangs, with stretches, and uh, but more importantly is isometric quads contractions. The patient's going to drive the knee straight. And I always tell them the pain they get in the fat pad region is nothing to worry about. You can drive through it. They will not cause damage to the knee because they're often frightened of that. If a contractor is established and you're in trouble, well, obviously carry on with physio, but there is some bracing that can help that the jazz brace as shown on the right involves half an hour sessions, three, two or three times a day. And every five minutes, the patient turns the knob and stretches the knee straight and slowly but surely with sustained tension, the knee will come out straight, but not every patient tolerates that well. Manipulation for getting a knee straight just does not work. And serial casting is, is dangerous as you've seen. I've seen nerve palsies, uh, full thickness, skin breakdown, et cetera, and it doesn't work. So a manipulation of serial casting for extension is not the answer. If you've got an established case, then we've got to do surgery. And the mainstay of surgery in all cases is a release of the fat pad, we'll show you that in a minute. And then if it's an established case and the knee won't come straight despite getting rid of the contracture, then you have to do a posterior capsule release. So what do we do? This is a picture of a lot of scarring in the fat pad. Normally the fat pad's yellow, as you know, here it's white. And this is a very abnormal situation. And that fat pad has lost its flexibility. It's like a door jam at the front of the knee. It won't get out of the way in extension. And it's a tether when the knee flexes. And so to release the fat pad, I take a, usually a knife these days or a radio frequency probe and make a, an incision right through the scarred fat pad, anterior to the anterior horn of the medial meniscus, just anterior to the intermeniscal ligament and anterior to the lateral meniscus. And I sweep the knife or the radio frequency probe right down the front of the tibia. I've never yet taken off the patella tendon, but I, I do that have that in mind, I promise you. And the scar is like a rind around the fat pad and you almost pop through it. There's tremendous resistance if you use a shaver on it to resect it. But if there are big lumps of scar tissue, you do that. It's really tough tissue. But as you get through into healthy fat pad, suddenly your instrument flies through that tissue, whereas it's tough when it's scarred. So you've got to release that anterior interval, first of all, resect any scar on the fat pad itself. But sometimes when you've done all that, you're sure that there's nothing restricting extension at the front of the knee, it still won't come straight. And these are usually cases three or four months old or later after surgery, you have to do a posterior capture release. And this is a fantastic operation that very few people practice or know how to practice. Knee is placed uh, with the hip abducted at 90 degrees, as you can see, and make a post-remedial incision over that soft spot when you palpate this area just behind the femoral condyle, then make a medial arthrotomy. And with sharp dissection, take the capsule here off the femur, and then cut the uh, gastrocnemus tendon off as well and proceed towards the midline. Obviously I'm aiming with my knife from posterior to anterior. I have a long handled blade to get as close to the bone as I can. As long as you stick to bone, you're safe. And then we'll get to the midline. And this is a picture taken with an arthroscope um, uh, illumination. And you can see here the gastroc is off with the capsule. I've stripped 
the soft tissue off with periosteal elevator. And then here we can see the septum that sits behind the PCL. And this is the moment of truth. And that's where most surgeons get very nervous because here is the artery and the neurovascular bundle. So you have your longer handle blade, you aim from posterior to anterior and you cut on to the lateral femoral condyle to open this posterior lateral recess. And once you're in, you're safe because you blade against the femur and you just peel off the capsule, you peel off the lateral gastroc and then use a periosteal elevator to strip the soft tissues. And this really allows for even hyperextension to come back. This guy actually, for me, is a bit of a disappointing result. He's two weeks post-op, he had a septic arthritis with a, about a 30 degree contracture. And he was just off straight when I saw him in clinic at two weeks. Uh, he did actually get straight, thankfully, with physiotherapy, but we can expect really good results. It's obviously surgery that needs to be taken with great care, but it works well. What about poor flexion? Well, um, this is a place where um, physiotherapy can help. There's a jazz brace for this as well, which slowly flexes. It's particularly useful for knee replacement patients. But manipulation does work for flexion. You, it's pointless doing it if the knee is angry because it's, you get a result on the operating table, but the stiffness will come back. So you've got to wait for the knee to be quiet with that inflammatory response burnt out. And it's very important you're careful doing it. You can fracture a tibia. I've managed to pull a tibial tuberosity off in a case. So you take both hands on the proximal tibia, both forearms up against the tibia, and then you spread your load as you lever into flexion. And I put my ear up against the lateral aspect of the knee as taught by Peter Myers in Brisbane. And you listen to the adhesion Obviously, if there's a period of silence, if you push too hard, you'll do some violent damage. So you know, it's time to stop. Um, we use a femoral nerve block so the quads don't fight um, flexion for, uh, for a day or two. So be very carefully got to mobilize with crutches. We use CPM. And I think the MUA is worthwhile, even in late cases. Even months later, you can get a win with it. But nevertheless, there are some cases you just can't safely manipulate. And so they all need surgery. And the mainstay of this is an arthroscopic arthrolysis of the problems within the joint. And to do this, we give tranexamic acid beforehand because we want to minimize bleeding. Nature's glue is blood after all. And I use a narrow, sharp punch. Uh, there aren't many smiley knives available these days, but that's a fantastic instrument or a radiofrequency hook. And basically you, you slide it up against the adhesions. First part of the job is to recreate the soup to the pouch and you shove your smiley knife or punch uh, until the, you feel that it yields through the contracture. So you recreate the pouch and then you go down the medial and lateral gutters again, have the knee bent as, uh, over the side of a table and you shove back against the scar tissue until it gives on you. Uh, then you go to the front of the joint, you've got to open the anterior interval and resect any fat pad scar as I showed you. I try, as soon as I see yellow fat, I don't do any more resection. You've got to preserve the fat pad. Now, some old reports where you had to resect the natural ACL and PCL. I think it's absolute nonsense. I can't believe that. Obviously, if you've got a horribly anterior femoral tunnel for an ACL graft, that's different. But the natural cruciates, I would leave. I can't see any reason to take them out. Once you're sure you've cleared the contracture, then you manipulate the joint and you usually get what you want. But of course, there are some cases in which there's a significant extra articular contracture and you have a quadriceps contracture. And if you fail to get more adequate bend with um, the arthrolysis, then you flex, you'll feel the quads tight and you'll realize that's what's stopping further flexion. So I undertake a Thompson quads plasty. Uh, I center my incision on the middle of the patellar approximately for the length of the rectus tendon. And then with diathermy, I cut the vastus medialis off the extensor mechanism, do the same for the lateral side. And then underneath the rectus femoris is the intermedius tendon. And that's like a rigid bar of scar tissue. So I put a knife um, between rectus femoris and the intermedius and excise that intermedius, which is a big contracture. And once I've done that, then I do a manipulation and you'll see that the vasti pull back away from the extensor mechanism. It's a wonderful operation. Again, it's not well known, certainly by European surgeons. So we don't have to do it too often, but it's a fantastic procedure. The, one of, the method I use is a Thompson procedure. It's written up in uh, Campbell's Orthopedics, but it's very simple, straightforward, and a fantastic result. 
So just to end there, my disclosure, disclosures again, none of them are relevant to that talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>